Assalamu alaikum and good morning everyone. I welcome you all to today's webinar on recent advances in nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Thank you very much everyone for joining us today. So I would like to inform you that Coordinator General Comstech, Professor Dr. Muhammad Iqbal Chaudhary could not join us today due to some prior engagements. So I would like to invite Senior Director HR and Administration Comstech, Mr. Aftab Hussain Zaidi for his welcome note, please. Bismillahir Rahmanir uh, Dear resource persons and participants of the Comstech Neprika webinar on recent advances in nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, Assalamu alaikum. I am Aftab Zaidi, Senior Director of Comstech. I welcome you all on behalf of Professor Dr. Muhammad Iqbal Chaudhary, Coordinator General Comstech and Comstech team. Today's webinar is on a very important topic that is the recent advances in NMR spectroscopy. During the last few decades, NMR spectroscopy has undergone a remarkable development and has several important applications. For example, medical practitioners employ magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, a multidimensional MRI NMR imaging technique for diagnostic purposes. Similarly, NMR is useful in drug discovery due to its ability to directly observe chemical compounds and target biomolecules and can be used for ligand-based and protein-based approaches. Today, we have a panel of three uh, resource persons who will share their knowledge and experience with the participants. These are our first resource person is Dr. Nahoko Yuchiyama. She is currently section chief of the division of pharmacognosy, phytochemistry, and narcotics at the National Institute of Health Sciences, Kawasaki, Japan. Dr. Yuchiyama received her PhD in pharmaceutical sciences from Kyoto University, Japan in 2004. Her expertise include regulatory science of pharmaceuticals, including natural medicine, illegal drugs, borderline products between foods and drugs, and natural product chemistry. She's also contributing to the development of Japanese pharmacopoeia, standards for crude drugs and campo extracts as a member of JP expert committee on crude drugs. Our second resource person today is Dr. Atiyatul Wahab. She is a professor at the Dr. Panjwani Center for Molecular Medicine and Drug Research, International Center for Chemical and Biological Sciences, University of Karachi, Pakistan. Dr. Atiya is trained as a structural and synthetic organic chemist initially. Later on, she was sent to the Scripps Research Institute, California, USA, to get training in structural biology in the laboratory of Nobel laureate, Professor Dr. Kurt Buttrich. She is now establishing the first structural biology laboratory in Pakistan at the PCMD. Dr. Atiya has many research publications in international reputable journals, as well as granted patents. Our third resource person today is Dr. Solomon Deris. He is a senior lecturer at the Department of Chemistry, University of Nairobi, with a vast research experience in the area of natural products chemistry. He has published over 60 journal articles in peer-reviewed journals and supervised postgraduate students from Cameroon, Congo, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. He has served the Natural Products Research Network for Eastern and Central Africa, Africa as its program officer from 2009 to 2014. He has conducted a number of NMR training courses during the summer school and pre-symposium workshops of NAFRICA in Sudan, Tanzania, and Congo. He's a member of NEPRICA, Kenya Chemical Society, and Royal Society of Chemistry. He is currently secretary of the Kenyan hub of the Pan-African Chemistry Network. On behalf of Comstech, I wish to express my sincere appreciation to the resource persons 
and moderators for their valuable time. And would like to thank the Comstech team, Ms. Maham, Ms. Khazima, and Mr. Sahiruddin for coordination. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your remarks. Uh, next, I would like to invite our first speaker for today, Dr. Nahoko Ochiyama, for her talk. Hello. Can I? Can yes, you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Can I share my slide? Yes, ma'am, please. Can you see my slide? Okay. Yes, we can see your slide. Okay. So, okay. I I'd like to start. Uh, thank you for uh, good morning and good eve after good eve afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm honored to speak at uh, this webinar. Uh, today, I would like to speak about the regulatory application of quantitative NMR, QNMR for us, say, in Japanese pharmacopoeia. I would like to speak about these five topics. The first one would be, what is quantitative NMR, QNMR? QNMR is a quantitative technique using the physical, utilizing the property that the ratio of the signal area observed on the NMR spectrum is proportional to the ratio of the number of nuclei in the molecule. This holds true whether the nuclei are part of the same molecular structure or located in different molecular entities. Therefore, QNMR can determine the purity of a sample with a substance different from the reference standard of the sample, such as, an, uh, such as appropriate internal standards. QNMR procedure consists of these three steps. Step one, sample preparation, including weighing. Step two, NMR measurement, and step three, data analysis. As I will show later, weighing is very important step because the purity evaluation of samples by QNMR requires accurate weighing. Also, if the internal standard is certified reference material, the absolute purity of the sample will be determined by using this equation because the purity of internal standard is already known. Next, I would like to speak about QNMR for the standardization of quantitative reagent in the crude drug section of the JP. This slide shows the contents of Japanese pharmacopoeia. In the general test and the general information chapters, QNMR is described. This slide shows the QNMR description in the JP. In JP16 Supplement 1, QNMR analysis technique and its application to reagent in the JP was listed under the general information of crude drugs. Next, in the crude drug test under the general test in JP16 Supplement 2, this section, assay of marker compound for the assay of crude drugs and extract of CAMPO formulations utilizing NMR spectroscopy was listed. In this section, the principle of QNMR, supply of reference materials and software, and the definition of SI traceable marker compound for HPLC assay are described. Simultaneously, the reagents for the assay of crude drugs determined by QNMR were listed in 9.41 reagent test solutions of general test. In the JP 18th edition published in June of 2021, QNMR has been described in the guideline for drafting the JP. 
This slide shows the list of reagents determined by QNMR that are used as reference standard in the assay of the crude drug section in the JP. As of February 2023, 22 reagents evaluated using QNMR are listed as reference standard in the assay of 46 monographs. Here, as an example, the content of a quantitative reagent, namely geniposide for assay, are shown. In the assay paragraph, the solvent, the reference standard for QNMR, target signals, etc., are described. Additionally, the operating conditions are shown, and the required detectivity for system suitability, specificity in system performance, and repeatability in system repeatability are regulated. The next topic is QNMR measurement of hygroscopic reagent. The purity evaluation of reagent by QNMR requires accurate weighing. However, the weighing of hygroscopic reagent may be affected by the environment. This slide shows the hygroscopicity of 21 standard product for crude drug test in the JP by water, water sorption, desorption analysis using thermal gravimetric analysis, TGA equipment. Substantial weight change due to the humidity change indicates high hygroscopicity. This result showed that ginseng size RB1 and RG1 and psychosaponin A, D, and B2 are hygroscopic, as highlighted in yellow. It can be assumed that the weight of hygroscopic reagents change easily depending on humidity. Consequently, their purities change. This is the actual graph of some reagent shown in the table on the previous slide. The red line showed weight and the blue line showed relative humidity. As shown by the graph of psychosaponin B2 and A on the left, substantial weight change due to humidity change indicate high hygroscopicity. On the other hand, the graph of magnolol on the right shows the less remarkable weight change due to humidity change indicates low hygroscopicity. Therefore, the hygroscopicity of reagent affects the purity of compounds based on the extent of increase in their water content. Next, the optimal of and reproducible sample preparation method for the QNMR of hygroscopic reagents was studied. This is a proton QNMR spectrum of a hygroscopic reagent, psychosaponin A, SSA. The 12 position signal around 5.7 ppm was used as a quantitative signal because no interference signal was observed. Usually, quantitative signals are selected such as no interference signal from impurities, a single signal or simple coupling signal. First, the purity was determined without humidity control before and during weighing in three facilities, as shown in table one. The results showed high variation in purity, 89.45 plus minus 2.79%. This indicates that SSA requires humidity control both before and during weighing. Next, before the humidity was controlled, the weight equilibration time of SSA was examined to determine the appropriate duration of humidity control before the weighing of SSA. Under the condition of 20 degree and 60% humidity, which was set using TGA equipment, the rate of weight change was less than 0.1% per hour after three hours. Therefore, the humidity control conditions 
for SSA was set as shown here. Next, we performed the QNMR of SSA with humidity control using a saturated sodium bromide solution. As shown here, the balance is set in a wind shield and several sodium bromide, bromide solutions are set in it for humidity control. The substantial QNMR analysis after the weighing of the reagent under controlled humidity in three facilities is shown in Table 2. The purity showed good result with low variation, 89.28 plus minus 0.76% as shown in Table 2. Therefore, it is revealed that the appropriate humidity control conditions for SSA were set at three hours or more at 20 degrees and 60% of the QNMR measurement of SSA. Next, I would like to speak about assay of perialdehyde in period halves based on relative molar sensitivity, RMS, using a combination of proton QNMR and HPLC UV. Perialdehyde PRL is an essential oil component derived from perilla, and it is a characteristic compound of the perilla half listed in JP17. Quantitative analysis of the PRL content in perilla halves was performed by conducting HPLC using an analytical standard of PRL. However, P PRL decomposes rapidly, especially in methanol. Therefore, the exact concentration of the analyte, analytical standard of PRL is unknown because of its easy decomposability. To overcome this problem, we adopted an alternative quantitative method using a single reference compound with relative molar sensitivity, RMS. RMS is determined using the ratio of molar ratio, RM, RM and the response ratio, RR. This determination is by first analyzing a mixed standard solution of a reference substance and analyte solution. Uh, using both QNMR and HPLC. Second, the molar ratio RM is obtained using QNMR. Third, the response ratio RR is obtained using HPLC UV. Finally, the RMS is calculated. This slide shows the differences between conventional chromatography and RMS chromatography. In the conventional method, an absolute calibration curve is plotted based on the concentration and peak area data using the standard of the analyte. And the analyte concentration is measured under the same condition. Hence, the reference standard of the analyte for assay is required to make the calibration curve. On the other hand, in RMS chromatography, Hypothetical calibration curve are plotted utilizing RMS to internal standard of known purity. Therefore, the internal, sorry, therefore the reference standard of the analyte for assay is not required. Sorry, the RMS is calculated using the ratio of the slope of the calibration curves of two substances namely the reference substance and the analyte. Therefore, if the RMS is known, even if the reference standard of the analyte is unavailable, a quantitative value of the analyte can be calculated using the reference substance. This slide shows the assay of the PRL contents in period hub in the new the JP18s edition. First, prepare the sample perilla hub and the reference substance diphenyl sulfon solution. Next, analyze the sample and the reference sample solution by conducting HPLC 
using the same condition as those used for RMS. Then the amount of PRL is calculated using the following equation. The last topic is ISO standardization of QNMR. As a final topic, I would like to introduce ISO standardization of QNMR. QNMR method was internationally standardized as ISO. ISO 24583, quantitative nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, purity determination of organic compound used for food and food product, general requirement for proton NMR internal standard method was published in December 19, 2022. The ISO project leaders are Japanese QNMR researchers and co-researchers of this QNMR study. The contents of ISO QNMR are shown here. This slide presents a list of acknowledgement of those who contributed to this study. I would like to thank everyone for their cooperation. Our QNMR research is reported in these papers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Uchiyama, for your very uh, interesting and informative presentation. Uh, in case anybody has a question, you can ask in the chat box, please. We can take questions in the next five minutes. If anybody has any questions, you can please type in the chat box. So, Professor, somebody is asking, can this file be available for reading purpose? Uh, yes, but uh, all of the slide is uh, um, available, but uh, a part of the slide uh, can, uh, it can be available. All right. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uchiyama. Uh, I think with this, we can move on to the next uh, presentation with the next talk. Uh, I would you. like to invite, thank you, Madam. I would like to invite Professor Dr. Atiyah Tulbaha, Professor at the International Center for Chemical and Biological Sciences for her talk, please. Hello, <laughs> assalamu alaikum. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Okay, so uh, I'm sharing my slides now. Can you see my slides? Yes, ma'am, we can see them. Assalamu alaikum and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Dr. Atiyat al Wahab and uh, working as uh, in the field of NMR spectroscopy, uh, both in biomolecular NMR and for small molecular NMR. So today, uh, one of the topic that uh, uh, I'm involved in is uh, the application of STD NMR. So we use this technique, NMR, it's one of the technique in NMR spectroscopy uh, that is used for the identification of a ligand with enzyme or any other protein. So uh, I'm going to present here two parts. One is uh, um, STD NMR of uh, um, SARS-CoV-2 protein and the other is NS5 of dengue virus. And we have used drug repurposing um, approach uh, for uh, uh, the identification of new ligands that um, can um, bind with these enzymes. So um, drug as we all understand that drug repurposing 
is the technique in which we can identify the new therapeutic indications of already approved drugs. <coughs> and, uh, and this is, uh, where, you know, the reason behind it, uh, since drug is already being uh, developed and it is in the market, so if and if we can identify a new potential use of these drugs, then it lower the cost and the time required for the drug discovery and development. As uh, uh, as chemists, we understand it requires about twelve to fifteen years for develop any drug to be developed and marketed, and also millions of dollars uh, investment required, which definitely uh, we as a developing country cannot afford to spend. Therefore, drug repurposing approach is uh, very ex one of the best technique to identify um, new indications of already existing drug. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, uh, I have a sore throat, so that's why uh, my presentation is a little bit interrupted. <clears throat> so, uh, one of the targets that also we have worked is the uh, main protease of SARS-CoV-2. And uh, it's a very well-known target uh, and uh, because it can also play a very important role in the viral replication uh, through the pro uh, processing of the viral polypeptide. I can show you here uh, that uh, after uh, the translation, of uh, <coughs> uh, RNA, viral RNA. Uh, there are two proteases, AMPRO, the main proteases, and the PLPRO, uh, the pepin-like proteases. These two proteases uh, play a very important role in the proteolysis of uh, the, um, the newly uh, developed or newly synthesized RNA. And then uh, with the proteolysis of this, it's a non-structural protein regenerated that is used in different processes in replication and uh, other vital processes so that the new viron is generated and then uh, liberated from the cell. So if we can inhibit um, these proteins, AMPRO, these proteases, uh, AMPRO and PLPRO, that could work as the potential uh, drug. <laughs> so, and uh, this protein, uh, AMPRO, is also one of the very conserved protein in different coronavirus viral strains. And uh, we have used NMR-based screening approach to identify the molecules that can interact with this protein. So, <clears throat> we have uh, the STD NMR, which is saturation. Transfer difference NMR spectroscopy is being used for these for this purpose. So, what basic concept is uh, uh, that we uh, saturate protein, and uh, since protein is quite big molecule, so if we saturate one proton uh, of the protein, the saturation is quickly transferred uh, to the whole protein through spin diffusion, and then it also transfer uh, to those part of the ligand which is in close proximity of protein. So uh, this is the approach that we have used. So uh, we have um, a saturate protein and then those ligand which are uh, close in contact with the protein, the saturation is transferred. So uh, we record on resonance spectra and off resonance spectra. And we need to subtract this since the name shows saturation transfer difference. So it's a difference spectra. So we uh, subtract these two spectra, and at the end, what we got is the interaction of those uh, ligands, which are uh, from the ligand side, those protons of the ligand, which are uh, which receive the uh, saturation from protein. We could observe. So here uh, you can see uh, this is the 1D. This is an example of the 1D spectra. 
and this is 1D STP spectra. So you can see these are the protons which receive the uh, saturation from protein. <clears throat> So this is another way of representing the same that, uh, and you know, there is one more important uh, limitation that if the ligand binds, uh, because uh, we usually have very high concentration of the ligand as compared to protein, usually like 100 to 200 folds uh, time um, more than the uh, concentration of the protein. So these ligands are in uh, equilibrium uh, if bind and unbound state. So if a ligand uh, has a tight binding uh, with the protein, so it means it will not come out after getting the saturation and we will not be able to observe the STD signal. Though this is already bound, but it's a limitation of the STD. So if, uh, if uh, we have uh, a good balance, uh, between bind and unbound state. So this saturation can transfer to these ligands and then there is another ligand which replaces this one and then another ligand. So we, in the higher concentration of the ligand, give very good difference spectra and we could identify if the ligand binds with protein or not. Uh, so um, in this process, we have evaluated 155 uh, drugs uh, in 31 uh, mixtures. So we uh, have, since STD is quite time consuming, the whole experiment to run these experiments on 600 megahertz really require uh, five to eight hours of experiments to reduce the time and to evaluate it more and more uh, drugs. We have grouped it in five, uh, in, a, in, in a way that uh, five drugs in one mixture. So that uh, we uh, run these STDs and those we find that uh, those mixture which uh, showing some interaction. So since we also record the proton and MR of each uh, component present in the mixture. So we compare it and then the longer the full STD of that particular compound is being run uh, using STD and MR spectroscopy. And, uh, um, so uh, outcome of uh, this one that uh, uh, we have identified 10 drugs, including uh, uh, remdesivir and dexamethasone, which uh, are used as an antiviral agent as well as a standard drug. And then we could find that these molecules are interacting with, uh, uh, with the protease. And, uh, uh, then we have also performed antiviral assay. Uh, we have uh, in our institute, um, Dr. Sabah Farooq is in charge of this lab and she has performed these experiments. And uh, uh, we have uh, grown SARS-CoV-2 uh, in the cell line and then treated these cell lines uh, to uh, observe the cytopathic effect. So here I can show you these cell lines in which we have uh, grown um, SARS-CoV-2 is the Vero cell line. And so these are the control cells of the Vero cell line. And uh, these, are, these images shows uh, that uh, they are, uh, there's cytopathic effect after 24 hours of post infection, 48 hours and 72 hours. So the infection increasing with time. And we have further confirmed uh, by isolating the RNA and then um, performed uh, real-time PCR to identify the different genes, the E gene, N gene, and ORF1 for the confirmation if uh, uh, these cell lines have uh, these particular viruses in, um, and then we can uh, incubate along with the compounds. So here I'm giving you some examples. Um, so here I'm giving you some examples which shows uh, that uh, this is chloroquine phosphate and uh, here in the chloroquine phosphate we can uh, see that uh, A is the proton NMR spectrum and 
uh, uh, B is the proton NMI spectrum and A is the STD NMI spectrum. So the difference spectrum you can see. These are the uh, protons which are highlighted uh, are receiving uh, the, con the saturation from protein. And then uh, looking at uh, um, the plaque reduction percentage, we can find this out that uh, this uh, protein, uh, this molecule is actually inhibiting the growth of the virus uh, by using uh, 41.5 micromolar at six uh, concentration of the compound and this one 63.2% uh, inhibition and 100% inhibition when we use 82.3 micromolar of chloroquine phosphates. So um, in the next example, the remixiver, another example of the antiviral drug, we can see these are uh, those highlighted ones are uh, the one which receives the saturation and uh, uh, at 82.3 micromolar concentration, 86.7% inhibition was observed in antiviral assay. And, uh, okay, so dexamethasone is an, another example which uh, we, where you can see that uh, there is uh, um, the, the uh, protons that are inhibiting the interacting with the protein and uh, it gives 77.2 percent inhibition and uh, these are uh, the drugs uh, which uh, kind of drug repurposed and uh, I'm sorry. Okay. here you can see this is uh, um, diazetam hydrochloride, which is a calcium channel blocker, and uh, it uh, uh, used to treat hypertension, high blood pressure, and chest pain. And here we can see that uh, the H4 and H28 and 29 are interacting with uh, the protein. And the plaque reduction as he shows that shows. Uh, it, uh, with the 82.3 micromolar concentration, 81.8% uh, inhibition. And then we also performed the molecular decking and simulation studies, which shows its interaction with the binding pocket of, um, of uh, the protease. And uh, the simulation study shows that the enzyme ligand complex is also very stable. So these are the examples uh, that we have done. Due to the limitation of time, I will just go through quickly. So another molecule um, and the drug which we have used uh, is losartan uh, potassium, which uh, also give a very good indication of its binding. And uh, it shows 54% of reduction. And uh, similarly, the docking score is also quite good when we perform docking studies and uh, and uh, this simulation study shows that protein ligand complexes is quite stable. So another example of amantadine hydrochloride, um, which shows the winding of uh, the color part is actually shows different, pro pro different percentage of saturation received and uh, the inhibition was 77.2. And again, it shows uh, good interaction when the binding pocket of um, uh, main protease of SARS-CoV-2. And the simulation shows it's a stable complex of uh, um, between a stable complex form between ligand and protein. And uh, then we also perform uh, the uh, study which can, uh, through which we can see uh, that um, the binding of the ligand with the protein uh, in terms of stability. If uh, this small molecules uh, can destabilize the uh, protein or not. So with this one, we could find that uh, there is uh, some changes in the stability, usually point between 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 uh, degrees centigrade. Another uh, uh, protein that we have used is for the drug repurposing is the NS5 of dengue virus. We know that dengue virus 
is uh, um, is very common in developing countries, including Pakistan, and uh, it's uh, also um, have uh, lots of risk of the human death. And according to WHO, um, over 390 million people got infected annually, and uh, 96 million uh, people shows a severe clinical symptom, and uh, more than 20,000 people die annually. So um, we have target NS5, non-structural protein 5 of dengue virus. And uh, this protein has two domains, mTase domain and RNA-independent RNA uh, polymerase domain. And it's uh, quite more than 100 KDA protein. And again, we have used the STD and MR approach. And we have checked 75 FDA-approved drugs. Uh, it, which were grouped in uh, 15 mixtures, and out of which these are the molecules which shows interaction with NS5. And here you can see uh, this is uh, diclofenic sodium, which shows uh, uh, good in interaction with the protein. And uh, this is the proton NMR, and this is the upper one, B is the STD NMR difference, and there are different percentage of the protein which shows. And again, the docking studies also shows that uh, the uh, compound showing interaction with the active site of the protein. And uh, similarly, another molecule, uh, which is uh, etopride, and uh, this uh, is also a drug, and it received different uh, percentage of inhibition, in percentage of interaction from the protein, and uh, um, so STD, uh, the molecular docking shows there is a good interaction with the uh, glutamic 149. And uh, this is another uh, molecule, which is atinolol, and it shows uh, uh, interaction with the protein. And uh, when we perform the docking study, again, uh, the docking score minus 4.3, which is a good one. And the next molecule which we, which uh, has shown the interaction is uh, uh, scopolamine, and, uh, and the STD and MR spectrum shows uh, the interaction of this protein, this molecule with protein, and uh, the ST and the docking also give uh, quite good score. So the next molecule is neohesperidine dihydrocalcone, and uh, here this one also shows good interaction. These are the colored one, which shows different percentage of interaction that the protein, that the, the ligand got from the protein. And uh, these are the docking. And the, uh, we have performed all uh, these compounds for the protease inhibition activity. And out of which the diclofenic sodium was, was found uh, to inhibit, uh, inhibit the um, uh, polymerase uh, activity and uh, at a concentration, I'm sorry, uh, at a concentration of uh, <clears throat> 500 micromolar or more than that. So these are the results. You can see that uh, at this point, 500 and 1000 micromolar, there is uh, 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 the activity has been um, completely inhibited. So, oh, I'm sorry. So, uh, in conclusion, I would like to say that uh, though it uh, has a limitation, but it's a, a one of the uh, important technique to understand the interaction of ligand with uh, protein. And I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, for drug repurposing of SARS-CoV-2, Mr. Abdul Mateen, my student, and Dr. Sabah Farooq for performing the antiviral assay. And uh, uh, the anti-dengue assay was performed uh, by Mr. Asmatullah. And we have a strong collaboration with Professor Pangong and uh, the financial assistance we have received from the cell company, HEC. Uh, PS, and this is, uh, we, they are the two labs in our institute of NMR spectrometers. We have the superconducting NMR and uh, spectros, uh, spectrometers, and we have upgraded all the systems to the NMR new system. 
and uh, uh, this one is the 800 and this this one is the oldest 300 and these are the uh, 600 and uh, we have four of them equipped with cryogenically cooled probes and so these are the different spectrometers that we have in our system and uh, i would like to invite you to be the member of nmr spectroscopy user group of Pakistan. thank you so much any question? Thank you very much, Dr. Atiyah. Uh, Madam, we have a few questions in the chat box. Should I yes. take them? Yes, yes. Okay. So somebody is <laughs> asking, what criteria did you use to select the 156 drugs for the repurposing? <clears throat> These criteria, um, mainly we, we were trying to find the, as because you know you need to understand that proteins are stable and can be in the buffer system. So, um, you know, these drugs or any molecule, that, uh, that's the limitation. Again, that when we, are, when we are selecting, that it need to be soluble in the buffer system. So this is one of the criteria that because uh, every drug is for uh, different purposes. So the main criteria that we have used is the solubility <clears throat> of the drug in buffer. Yeah. So the okay. next question. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Solomon yeah. is asking, how can one determine the molecules that bind best with the target using STD NMR since you have grouped 155 <coughs> compounds into groups of five? Okay, so uh, thank you, Dr. Solomon. It's a very nice question. <clears throat> so uh, we actually record the proton NMR of every molecule that we are going to group. So uh, when we have the uh, STDNMR run of the mixture, then we compare it with individual protons. You know, we overlay uh, with the individual protons. And since we already have the proton NMR of each individual molecule, so when we compare and exactly know which one is showing the interaction, so then we take out that proton, that select dot particular uh, compound and run uh, the STD NMR of the individual, which shows interaction in mixture. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, ma'am. Uh, yeah. So next question is, uh, did you perform MMGBSA calculation to confirm your docking results after MD simulation? Uh, actually, this one is done by um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Humaira Zafar. And uh, uh, I'm not expert in MD simulation. I'm expert in NMR. So I hope that she has done this. So you can ask me a question about STD, NMR, or NMR spectroscopy in general. OK. Uh, Madam, people are asking, how can they use the facility of NMR of their samples? Uh, and <laughs> what will be the route? OK. so. Um, I'm also the NMR uh, spectroscopy facility in charge. And uh, so uh, if, uh, if this question is from Pakistan uni universities or institutions within Pakistan, so I would request you to uh, apply uh, to HEC or PCSIR and through which you can send the application of the, you know, any requested facility that you want to use. And uh, then after its approval, uh, and whoever uh, need uh, get more detail, you can send me email. You can get the email address of mine. I can write in the checkbox. So I can send you the whole detail and then you can apply. And uh, then HEC or PCSIR select your sample. Usually they select everything, whatever you uh, ask for. And then after, after this, you can send it, uh, so you can send your compound to us for the analysis and we will send you the result. <clears throat> Got it. And Thank if you, this question is uh, from someone who uh, abroad wants to avail this facility, so I would request you to send email to our director, uh, Dr. Iqbal Chaudhry, and uh, then uh, he can take decision. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Same is asking, is talking complementary to STD NMR technique? Um, as a matter of fact, it's just the basic docking. So it's 
shows um i you know it's it's not very extensive uh, means like not like uh, we can use as a uh, docking in in this uh, with reference to um selection of the drugs or something because we used it as a complementary technique you know it's uh, just an additional way of representing how the molecule is interacting with the protein uh, however um, since we already know the real interaction because nmr in std nmr nmr is a technique which shows real image what is really happening or not is not like docking or something which uh, just showing something hypothetical so this is the real ex real experiment with real interaction that we observe and uh, so docking is just uh, uh, showing the way these molecules are interacting with the protein but if you know in in my experience uh, i have seen that uh, even those molecules which are not interacting if you uh, run uh docking experiment you could see good docking score and everything but uh we complement this one because we already know that this is there is a real interaction present in nmr so um yeah that's it um okay ma'am we have a lot of questions but we'll take two more because of time limitations uh, so uh somebody is asking what will be the effect on chemical shift if ligands are loosely bonded or tightly bonded yeah if uh, if the ligand is uh, uh, tightly bonded so since you know in stdmr we have like 104 204 more uh, ligand as compared to the protein concentration so if it is tightly bonded so it means you know it's a uh, um it it cannot come out after receiving the saturation from uh, the protein so and it's like you know um, it's like uh, we uh, developing you know the nosy which is a combination of lots of molecules which receive so we can good see the good uh, intensity but if the molecule is not coming out the other molecule will not go and replace it so we will not observe std this is the limitation you know but it doesn't matter it doesn't mean that there is no interaction there there is an interaction but it's a limitation of std and nmr that we cannot observe and uh, similarly if the molecule is very loosely bind so there is not enough time for the molecule to remain in in the active site to receive the enough saturation so that is why we cannot observe either so this is the limitation of std and nmr experiment right uh, and just last question ma'am um, can we use it for venom peptide characterization for bioactive molecules yes you can uh, use definitely uh, yeah but the one thing which is again another limitation the size of the protein you know bigger the protein the std signal you more chances to to see the std nmr if the size of the peptide or the protein is very small like 100 kg or 15 kg you may observe std you may not so the bigger the size of the protein like if you have like 35 40 50 100 100 kg protein then you will see good std uh, and this is again a limitation lots of limitation it has all right thank you very much dr atia thank you very much for your very informative session uh, so with this uh, with this we move on to the next speaker who is dr solomon jerise who is the senior lecturer at the department of chemistry university of nairobi kenya over to you sir yes uh, good morning and good afternoon Uh, my name is Solomon, and uh, so what I'm going to attempt uh, now is to discuss about the use of NMR in structural elucidation of natural products. Of course, the time available is not going to be enough to discuss the uh, importance of NMR in structural elucidation of uh, organic compounds. So what I will do, I will uh, go as far as I can. but i will share the slides uh, with the organizers so that whoever is interested in looking at this uh, can further interact with it 
<laughs> Sorry, nice slide. Yeah. So this is just another, the basic workflow we use uh, for uh, isolation and uh, structural elucidation of uh, natural product from biological sources such as plants. And uh, once the compounds are isolated, the next and most important step is their uh, structural elucidation using uh, a combination of uh, uh, instrumental techniques. In addition to this, it's very, very important. You can get adequate information from the chemotaxonomy, from the biosynthesis, from the color, whether the compound is UV active or not, from it is array value, whether it is polar or non-polar, and simple experiments like optical rotation. These can give very useful information towards uh, the, the structure, the determination of the structure of a, a natural product. So you can use your fancy spectroscopic methods to determine the structure of a natural product, but the structure you obtain at the end of the day must be consistent with this very basic information. So there are so many different types of instrumental methods that are available for the determination of the structure of uh, uh, organic compounds. I do not have time to go through each of them in detail, but I'll just uh, touch on them. One of them is IR, which gives us information about the different types of functional groups that are uh, in the molecule you under study. We have UV, which can give us information about the different type of chromophores that are available in the molecule. And this we can also use in uh, structure elucidation. Uh, of course, MS uh, can give us information about uh, the molecular formula. And, and also from the fragmentation pattern, it can give us information about the structure of the molecule. In addition to this, there are uh, at the end of the day, uh, NMR or uh, these uh, techniques I described probably will give us uh, the, the structure of the molecule, but may not give us a gross structure of the molecule, but may not provide us information about the, the relative and absolute configuration of uh, the molecule. And in order to determine the stereochemistry, the special relationship of the different groups in a particular molecule, we use a number of uh, techniques, simple basic optical uh, activity measurement, uh, X-ray crystallography, different type of uh, uh, circular dichroism techniques um, can be used. For example, this is one of uh, our PhD student who used uh, calculations, uh, CD calculation by comparing uh, experimental CD with uh, calculated CD. He was able to determine the configuration of uh, the compounds he was studying. So, so my focus today is on NMA, on NMA. Just, just the reason why I brought this ones is because in addition to NMA, there are other techniques one can use in determining the structure of a natural product. And it's very important that uh, you have access to these resources and get uh, relevant information about the structure of the molecule. Of course, NMR, is uh, the most comprehensive method for determination of the structures of unknown compounds. And uh, NMR, in, in NMR, we use uh, 1D proton and carbon-13 NMR and 2D bit uh, homonuclear or heterolecular techniques to determine, unequivocally determine the structure of organic compounds, natural products. And um, what I want uh, to take you through some of the strategies one can use for elucidating the structure of natural product using NMR. And then I will give uh, examples from uh, my PhD work and the works of some of our students, what the, the, how they used NMR in determining the structures of uh, their molecules. Uh, first, I will uh, just strategies of uh, how to use proton and carbon-13 NMR in determining the structure of unknown natural products. And uh, this is a proton 
NMR of one of these compounds, which I worked on during my PhD. And uh, in, in, in an MR spectra like this, you see different types of peaks. They are, they are at different chemical shift values. They have uh, different shapes, different multiplicities. Some are doublet, others are singlet, others are triplet, quartet, et cetera. And then, and then they also have different integration. You can use these observable properties from the proton NMR to determine the structure of uh, any type of uh, uh, natural product, however complex it is. So what are the steps one can use in interpreting the proton um, NMR of an unknown compound? Uh, so first, the first step is to determine uh, the, the different number of uh, types of protons we have in the molecule from um, so based from the from the spectra you determine the number of the different number of protons you have in different chemical environment in the molecule so in this particular case there were 14 different protons so once you have identified them so the next thing you need to do is uh, to classify these different uh, peaks uh, and determine uh, their, their uh, functional groups. Because depending on uh, how they interact with magnets, different protons will appear at different chemical uh, sheet values. For example, those at around uh, from six to eight, those are aromatic. These ones are heteroatomic, aliphatic, et cetera. So as much as possible, you use the proton NMR to you list the different uh, protons and then uh, try as much as possible to determine what they are as aromatic, as aliphatic, uh, aromatic, methoxy, et cetera, some of which at the beginning of your experiment, you may not be able to determine. At the beginning of your investigation, you may not be able to determine. But as you interact with uh, with the data, with uh, from additional data, it is possible for you to determine what uh, resulted in all these specific signals in the proton NMR. And then from uh, the area under each of these curves, you can determine the relative number of protons that contributed to uh, that uh, each of these represent. So like this one has um, an integration of one, basically means this one is because of one aromatic, one proton, this has got three, it is a, a methoxy, et cetera. So you list that. So as you, as you do so, you will build information, more and more information about the structure of your compound. And then the other very important uh, information which one can obtain from the proton NMR is a splitting pattern and a coupling constant. Like this one is a doublet, these ones are singlet, and then this is a, these two are doublets, these are doublets of the doublets with a specific coupling constant. And these ones can give us information about uh, the different types of uh, protons for, that we have. For example, this one is a doublet. It basically means it is to it is next to a carbon that has got one proton applying the n plus one rule. So based on that, based on that, uh, you determine the various multiplicities and the coupling constants. So from the coupling constant, you can have information about how two particular protons that couple with each other are related. For example, if you look at the signal at 7.89 and 6.71, each of them appearing as doublet, their coupling constant is 8.8. .8. This basically indicates these are two aromatic uh, protons which are next to each other, orthocoupled, et cetera. So as much as possible, extract information, pieces of information, and combine all this uh, together 
to give you some information about the structure of an organic. So when you put all this together, you, you can have such kind of uh, information which you can later use in determining the structure of, uh, so this is what one can obtain from the proton NMR. Similarly, from the carbon, the carbon 13 NMR also gives us signals at different chemical shift values. And uh, based on that, uh, you can determine what type of, what specific type of uh, carbons uh, these are. The first thing you need to do, sorry, when, uh, when, the, when, the, when uh, analyzing the carbon 13 NMR, the ATP or depth data of an unknown compound is first to list them, to list all this. Uh, you do not have to just list them from uh, one with a chemical shift value to the lowest chemical shift value, identify each of them. That's the first thing you, you need to do. Uh, and then after that, you tentatively determine the uh, type of functionalities from the chemical shift value. As you are aware, those that resonate around this area are mainly carbonyl compounds. And then those that are around here, aromatic, most probably uh, those that are uh, on heteroatom, like uh, uh, hydroxyl or oxygenated or those with nitrogen, et cetera. And then those on these sides are aliphatic. Based on that, you classify this as uh, carbonyl heteroaromatic. This, you do it uh, tentatively first, but as you go along with, uh, with uh, your analysis, you might be forced uh, to revise this. Uh, okay, uh, for example, uh, this one at around 109.5, uh, I tentatively gave it as either aromatic or olefinic, but, but uh, later on, I found that this is because of a methylene dioxy group, the CH2 flanked by two oxygen atoms. And since it is very deshielded, it resonates up to 109.5. But all the same, you classify it tentatively as that, and then uh, continue to refine. Uh, and then, using the depth or the attached uh, proton transfer uh, experiment. Now you can now determine the different, uh, the, sorry, you, you can now determine uh, or differentiate the different types of signals in, uh, in the carbon-13 NMR, uh, whether based on the number of hydrogen that are directly bonded to those. So you can classify them if they do not have any uh, group hydrogen attached to them as quaternary, as CH, as CH2, as methyl, et cetera. Uh, and then with this information, of course, if the compound uh, you be looking at is a, a non-organic compound, and you have experience with such type of organic compounds, you will be in a position to determine uh, their structure just from the simple proton and uh, carbon-13 NMAT from the 1D experiment. But you might require to do 2D experiments, be it homonuclear, like cozy, toxic, noisy, roisy, and uh, heteronuclear, HSCQC, and HMBC data are required to help you uh, assemble all this piece of information in coming up with a structure of product. So those uh, which you can use is uh, HCPC. HCPC is just really shows you which upon which hydrogen is on which uh, carbon. So I don't know, is my internet good? Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes, yes, Dr. Solomon, we can hear you. Okay, good, 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 good. Sorry, it was telling me weak signal. So anyway, uh, so from uh, these uh, cross peaks, you can determine which uh, proton is on which carbon. So from this direct correlation, now you know you have the different types of protons, you have the different types of carbon. Now using this HS, QC experiment, you will know this 
hydrogen is on this carbon, etc. Uh, and then you use cozy, cozy to give you uh, which proton is next to which one, which we have uh, somehow tried to determine from uh, the coupling constant, but in the cozy, it is a proton versus proton uh, spectra. And then you have the diagonal and then across the diagonal, uh, we have peaks that are uh, symmetrical. This one and this one, this one and this one. These ones are coupling partners. From this, you will be able to determine which proton and which ones are next to each other to help you assemble this information in coming up with the structure of your unknown organic compound. And of course, the other one, uh, which one can use is HMBC. This is a heteronuclear multiple bond correlation, not direct uh, high proton carbon correlation, but it, it will give you uh, information on uh, which proton is bonded to which, uh, uh, is correlated to each carbon separated by two, three, and sometimes four bonds, so that you know uh, how close, how uh, in relation to each other, the different fragments are related to each other. So HMBC detects correlation between carbons and protons, which are not directly bonded, unlike uh, Causes, uh, I mean uh, HSUQC. So it will show you this uh, carbon and uh, this proton are um, separated from each other by uh, two or three carbon atoms. So that you collect this fragment in determining. Uh, so, for example, HMBC can give you, uh, can enable you to determine the structure of a combo among the number of possible structures. For example, one of uh, my students using uh, NMR, he was able to determine grossly this to be the structure, but he was unable to determine whether this is a structure or this one, which differ based on the position of the two perennial groups, these two perennial groups, and he used uh, HMBC correlation of this proton with uh, this, that one, this one, and this one together with that one, and also the correlation uh, and the correlation of this proton uh, with this carbon to unequivocally determine the structure of the compound to be this one. So another, of course, to, uh, to the experiment one can use is no noisy. In COSI, it gives us information uh, on uh, protons that are uh, joined to one another through a chemical bond. But uh, NOISY will give us information about protons that are in close spatial proximity. This proton and these protons are close to each other. They are not necessarily bonded uh, to each other. And this noisy can be used uh, for determining uh, the relative stereochemistry of a, a particular compound, among other things. OK, just like it is interp interpreted the way uh, COSI is interpreted, except that noisy spectra appear similar in, in to COSI. However, instead of providing information about Couple protons, noisy, and it is advanced from noisy spectra show of diagonal peaks between pairs of protons that are in close in space, but they are separate, they are bonds apart. So, for example, noisy can easily uh, help us uh, lo uh, locate uh, this met metoxy group at this particular position and not here or here because of the NOE interaction between this proton and the methoxy, this and that. Of course, noisy uh, is, is a classical experiment one can use to determine uh, the relative configuration. For example, this in this pterocarpan, 
these two photons could be cis as shown in here or trans. If they were trans, this proton will come out of the board this way, the other one will go the other, the other way, they will not be in close spatial uh, proximity, therefore they will not have any noisy correlation. But since these two protons have shown a noisy correlation, they must be on the same side, therefore uh, the CD ring junction is uh, cis and not trans. So as a rush, I rushed through all these things. And uh, when you try to determine the structure of an organic compound, an unknown organic compound, uh, information that is obtained from chemotaxonomy, from biosynthesis, whether the compound is colored or not colored, whether it is UV active or not, whether it is optically active or not. This simple uh, information can give us a lot of inf uh, data about the structure of uh, an unknown organic compound. So if you have to use uh, different NMR techniques to determine the structure of uh, an unknown organic compound, first use uh, proton NMR, generate as much data as possible from that, and then use carbon-13 NMR, generate as much data as possible from that, uh, uh, from the chemical shift values, et cetera, from the integration, et cetera, from the splitting pattern, et cetera. And then once you have this, you want to determine what type of, uh, the, what type the carbons are, whether they are methylene, whether they're quaternary, whether they are methyl, et cetera and then use this 2D technique called HSUKC to determine which proton is on which carbon. Then once you have done that, you can use, so I left, uh, I forgot to include in here uh, the HMBC, okay, sorry, COSI, and then uh, HMBC, then noisy correlation. If you follow this step and provide, uh, get info, as much information as possible from this, you can be in a position to determine the structure of an unknown uh, organic uh, compound. What I want you to know, that in terms of theory, NMR is not very complicated. It's not very complicated. But it stops to be science and becomes an art. And like any art, it's only when you practice, starting from simple, molecules and as you go to more complex and molecule when you as you continue to practice you'll perfect the skill otherwise understanding what proton NMR is all about what kind of information you can obtain from that it is available in any undergraduate uh, program but that alone is not enough to enable you to determine the structure of a chemical compound you need to practice and practice and develop the art thank you so much Hello. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Solomon, yes. for your very uh, informative, very, <laughs> very interesting presentation. Yeah. So if anybody has a question, you, you may ask now in the chat box. Okay, sir. So we have a question. How will we know that carbon belongs to which group? For example, it may belong to aromatic or aliphatic group. Um, okay. So as uh, I try to discuss, mm -hmm, very good. so the, um, you have different uh, peaks you see in the carbon-13 NMR, and the ones you see on the left are uh, the most shielded so there uh, there are groups that are attached to them that withdraw electron so re re reduce the electron density and then these ones are the most electron rich compared to the standard TMS so based on their position in the carbon 13 NMR uh, it is possible uh, to determine which ones are uh, uh, carbonyl, 
which ones are because of aromatic, which ones are because of olefinic. Of course, there is some kind of overlap. So at the end of the day, uh, try as much as possible to tentatively determine what their functional group is. But as you go along, you will need or you require to refine this because there are other experimental data that you come across from the other techniques that will, uh, that's not going to be consistent with the, your initial or your, your tentative assignment. Otherwise, roughly, uh, the carbon 13 enema is very widespread. Uh, unlike the proton, which is normally from zero to 12, the carbon 13 in MR goes all the way up to 200 plus. So it is very well spread and the different regions are clearly delineated. Okay, so you can use that tentatively. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. We have another question. Uh, uh, regarding your presentation, how do you proceed in case of impurities on the spectra? How do you succeed to ignore them? Of course, uh, it is uh, it is a tough question. Of course, um, as much as possible, in uh, when you want to determine the structure of an organic compound, as much as possible, you must make sure they are pure, because as impurities can affect uh, the signal and you may not be able to determine which one is because of uh, a compound of interest or, uh, or uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, an impurity, et cetera. But there are uh, cases where uh, it becomes very difficult to isolate uh, two compounds or maybe even three using the chromatographic techniques that are that's available to you. And it's possible to determine the structure of such compounds, especially if it is not very complicated mixture. For example, if you have a mixture of two, it is possible to identify uh, the signals for, for each of the compounds as much as possible. Because you remember the integration, the integration is uh, uh, proportional to uh, pro proportional to the number of protons that are producing a particular uh, signal. And uh, so when you do that, okay, for example, you have determined uh, this to be one, you have determined this to be now one, and then based on that, you, you get this one, this is six, this is uh, two, et cetera. Okay, this is two, et cetera. Then all of a sudden, have one, which is about 0.5, 0.3, etc. Then you see that consistently like that. In those peaks, you can identify them not a part of this major compound, but another minor compound. So if there is no uh, very much sig signal of a lab, it is possible to identify those peaks and determine the structure. All right, thank you very much, sir. So since we're short on time, we can take one more question. Uh, somebody is asking, can you suggest some books or other resources for practicing NMR for the beginner natural product chemist? Um, so what what I what I will do uh, what I will do I will uh, after this let us kindly engage and uh, I will identify I will identify. Uh, some specific books and specific websites and specific examples which uh, one uh, can use to learn about NMR. But the most important thing, as I said, that NMR as a, th as, as, a, as a concept, as a theory, is not very complicated. You can know the theory very well, but that does not make you, uh, give you the, the skill to determine even the structure of a simple compound. So you need to practice and practice and practice and practice. And as an art, you can uh, develop it. Okay, so uh, we can, uh, can talk and you, uh, if you remind me as, as an organizer later, I will, I will identify some of this and share with you together with my presentation. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Solomon. So if uh, you have any more questions, the participants, you can get in touch with our speakers via email. 
So with this, we come to the conclusion of today's session. I would like to thank all our respected speakers for the very informative um, uh, talks and lectures and for taking out your precious time for us. And thank you so much to all our national and international participants for joining us today and for uh, your very interesting questions. Thank you very much and hope to see you in future important events. Thank you and goodbye.